Hello, folks. My name is James Bach. And uh, what we, who we have here today is uh, James uh, Christie. Uh, James Christie is uh, well known to my community of software testing people for introducing us to the idea of rent seeking behavior, <laughs> which is the uh, practice of uh, organizations such as uh, ISTQB and the uh, ISO uh, standards organization to some degree of getting us to be dependent upon them uh, to tell us if we are qualified to do our work uh, and then and charging us for that uh, uh, right uh, when they have done nothing to earn uh, the right to do that and add no value during that process. And it turns out there's a nice little word for that. It's called rent seeking. <laughs> a uh, yeah. group of people take over a juncture in the road and they set up a toll booth without any authorization to do so. And now we're all, we're all paying money to them. It's really so, good to know people were paying attention when I was giving that talk in New York. In it, was 2014. Uh, it was electrifying. It was a whole new concept that we that we learned about and and helped me criticize the ISTQB in a new way. So I I uh, uh, appreciate you for that, uh, James. But uh, James, you were you are not a um, a tester as such. You are you come from an auditing background. Is that is that correct? Yeah, um, I kept on moving around throughout my career in IT. I've always found it fascinating and I could never say no when I was offered an interesting opportunity. So I started off, I actually started off uh, as a user in the investment division for a big life insurance company. And the technology seemed more interesting than the accounting. So I switched into uh, become a tra trainee developer uh, with the rival company. And so I spent a few years in development and I moved into IT audit. I was approached to that and that seemed really interesting. Then I got lured back into development and then testing. And then when I was working for IBM, I also worked in information security management because they thought my background in auditing and technical development and testing meant that I could pick up the, the, the basic points of security quite easily, which is true. And so I did that, then I moved back into testing. And so continually moving around like that meant that I got a fair, I was able to look at uh, problems from different angles, whereas most people were used to having worked all the time in development or all, the t all of their career in testing or maybe a, a limited experience in another field. Whereas I, had, I was um, a jack of all trades. I'm not, uh, I don't regard myself as being a really expert tester or an expert in any particular fields, but I've got real worthwhile experience in many different areas. And I think that makes me almost unique because there's hardly anybody that has got real experience in testing and serious experience in IT audit too. And I think that's a real shame because the two roles are complementary and people who understand both roles I think I've got a worthwhile contribution to make. Well, so that's why I keep on. Then. I can't keep my mouth shut. I'm glad you're here. Then uh, now we're here today because you have a special interest in the so-called post office scandal, yeah. uh, which is a titanic example of bad software uh, yeah. doing real damage to real people. And so yeah. I'd like you to tell us, if you assume that the people viewing this haven't yet heard of the post office scandal in the UK, tell us about it. Okay. What I think people need to understand, first of all, is the role of the post office in the UK. It's, uh, it's not just a business. It's uh, valued and trusted. Uh, part of British society. Every town and village has got its post office where people do transactions where they interact with the state. They 
pay taxes, they they buy licenses from the from the government. Uh, there's all sorts of business they transact with the, the government there. And the sub the postmasters and sub postmasters have traditionally been a very valued and trusted part of British society. They're really important members of their local communities. And the post office, because it has this valued and trusted role, they came to see themselves as being a pillar of, the, of society and they saw themselves as being one of the, the good guys of British society, the British economy. And that was an important factor in their inability to see what they were doing wrong. They thought if they were doing something, they must be doing it well, they must be justified. Uh, they became slightly, well, rather out of date by the 1990s. They'd not invested in technology and they were getting left behind. And the government was putting pressure on them to bring their branch network up to date and to use technology in a meaningful way. And they outsourced the development of a new computer system to uh, the British computer company ICL, who were taken over by Fujitsu. And there was a massive development that started in the mid 1990s to computerize the huge post office branch network. And it was really ra rather over ambitious. They tried to do too much too quickly. And they picked the possibly the worst possible supplier to, to do it because Fujitsu, we now know they won the contract based on price rather than quality. And they proceeded to do a botched cowboy job developing a badly flawed system. The, the development we now know from evidence that's emerged to the public inquiry that's ongoing, we know that they were dreadful, that their development and testing practices were beyond dreadful. They were just amateurish. They were winging it. Uh, so the system, the horizon system that was implemented was seriously flawed. It had many bugs. It was not a reliable accounting system, and that was one of its basic functions. Well, this is not unusual in the industry. There's nope. lots of systems that are bad systems, of yep. failed yep. projects. And, I, yep. I, read in, uh, I, I read in a book about the post office scandal that Fujitsu scored at the bottom of the rankings uh, in eight out of 11 categories yep. that they were considering. So they... <laughs> Apparently, if you can you can be uh, terrible in eight out of eleven categories, but apparently they were just looking at one category, which is how much is it going to cost, and uh, they were big winners uh, in, in, um, in that. And so, like, uh, this is not a this is not an atypical story. No, but what? But the, but there's something about this scandal which is very non-typical. This is not yeah. just a story of bad software and a failed uh, uh, project. So so go on and tell us what what's special exactly. about it. Yeah, exactly, James. Uh, I don't think Horizon was uniquely flawed. However, um, the relationship between the post office and the sub-postmasters was really quite unusual. The people who are running the branches were not employees of the post office. They were independent contractors who signed a contract to provide a service to the post office, and they were provided with a system to do that. The contract, as it was written, meant that they did not have the rights of normal employees. They were The contract made them responsible for any losses uh, that the post office incurred at the branch. And they were responsible unless they could demonstrate why they were not responsible. If the system they were using, which was Horizon, recorded a loss, if that said that there should be £10,000 in cash at the branch, 
but an ins branch inspection showed that there was only a thousand there. That meant that there was nine thousand pounds missing, and the sub postmaster had to pay that back. So what you're saying is, so the the sub postmasters were obliged to use software. Yep. That was that if that software was bad then and and through no fault of their own uh the software said that there was money that was uh missing the sub postmasters were in a uniquely weak position yes to do anything about that they would just have to 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 eat that deficit exactly and these were life-changing amounts of money that um, the Horizon system was recording as discrepancies. Uh, discrepancies would build up over time and they'd reach the tens of thousands of pounds. And so the sub-postmasters were having to hand over their life savings. They're having to take out loans to repay the post office for what we now know were non-existent losses. They were... They were simply bugs that were generating false discrepancies. And, and nobody knew that the system was buggy. The the sub postmasters couldn't say, hey, this is this system is stealing from me. They, that was what they said, but the post office told each individual sub postmaster. You're the only one who's saying this. Nobody else is telling us that they're having problems. And that was a straightforward was a lie? lie. When they said it? Straightforward was lie, yeah. So yes. they, the people who were saying this actually knew that there were masses of complaints and they yes. pretended that yes. they weren't. Now, yes. is, that, is that just regular evil behavior by evil people? Is that all there is to that? Uh, there's... Uh, Yes and no. I mean, they, it was evil. But I think part of the reason was, as I referred to earlier, the, the post office has this special place. People who worked for it thought that they, they it was a good organisation. They were the good guys. And what they were doing must be OK. And also, they, it was very insular. People would join straight from school and they'd work their way up over the decades. It didn't have an awful lot of churn. They didn't have fresh ideas, fresh people coming in from outside. And they had too many people who were ingrained in the post office culture, who were over-promoted and out of their depth and didn't realise it. Uh, well, I'm interested in the phenomenon of somebody telling a direct bald-faced lie you mm -hmm. are the only one complaining but they know yeah. that there are there are in fact many people who are complaining now i well, think they, there is a possible explanation other than it's just evil people who lie and that is possibly that if you hear a lot of complaints but you believe that these complaints are all bad information they're all false Yes. Then you might say, "Oh, there have been no complaints." What you mean if there is that there's been no credible complaints? Exactly. Yes. They and, believe, and you they believe that you're a virtuous person. Like I would tell you if I thought there was a credible complaint, but all of these complaints are just people belly aching and lying yes. and making excuses. So mm -hmm. what I meant was not that there are no complaints, but there are no complaints from people i trust <laughs> exactly james uh, in order to understand what was happening at the post office you have to try and understand the culture and they'd convinced themselves that they were in the right uh wow they're in the, <laughs> now, where so this is, yeah, this is it's not just the problem in in science that happens where you begin to systematically ignore data Yes, um, I, I experienced this in a uh, when I was learning to fly an airplane, and I was on my 
what's called the dual cross country flight. So my instructor was sitting next to me. My, my older brother was teaching me to fly an airplane. He's sitting next to me and I am supposed to fly 50 miles to another uh, place. So I'm doing my flight and I'm navigating. And I notice that the compass says that I am going in the wrong direction. The compass was about 90 degrees off of where I thought I was going. But the previous evening, I had read about how you can't really trust compasses. They can be fooled by the structure of your aircraft mm -hmm. and anomalies and nearby hills. So the reason why I discounted what my compass was saying is it was a beautiful day and I could clearly see where I was going. And I was mm -hmm. supposed to be headed for the uh, the gap between two mountains. So I was headed for this gap. So I, I look at the, the, the compass. I see the compass tells me that I'm going at a right angle from where I should go, but I'm I'm gonna look, I'm I can see with my eyes that I'm I'm going in this this way. I've looked on the map, I'm looking for this gap between two mountains. There's a gap, I'm going there. Then at a certain point, my brother said, What's that airport that we are flying over right now? And I look on my map and I say, Well, we are not flying over any airport. And he said, well, look out the window. There's an airport underneath us. What airport is that? And I'm like, well, it's not on the map. <laughs> and I'm trying to scratch my head like, what? what could be going on here? And that's when my brother told me that I was in the completely wrong place. And it turned out what was happening is I had looked on the map for this gap between the two mountains. But when I looked out my window... I was actually steering at the gap between two different mountain ranges that oh, was right. 20 times wider than the gap between mountains that I was looking for. So I, I had convinced myself that yeah. I was in the right place looking at the right thing. And that meant that, that if I saw data that didn't match up with that, I was looking for plausible reasons why that data could be bad data. Mm -hmm. And it's it was a really helpful event to have this happen for me because it was a great experience in the strength of rationalization that was not from an evil place. I was trying to navigate. I had every interest in navigating correctly I discounted this data because I legitimately thought it was bad data. It turned out yep. the instruments were correct and I should have listened to them. Yes, a compass can be inaccurate, but probably not 90 degrees inaccurate, maybe five degrees inaccurate. And I had decided I had talked myself into uh, a, accepting a much, much larger discrepancy that should have caused me to double check my data um, much sooner. Maybe a similar kind of effect is happening in, a, in an organization like the post office in, in, in your case that you're, that you're talking about. Yeah, I, th I think you're quite right. I mean, how long did that episode take? Half an hour or so? But the, the post office it continued over more than 20 years, this denial of reality. It's, and how damaging was this? Hugely, uh, because hundreds, maybe thousands of people have had their lives ruined. People have been were sent to jail. Uh, I, I said that um, sub postmasters were having to hand over life changing sums of money to the post office. Yes, but many of them were also prosecuted for theft and for false accounting. They went and, to jail, and they went to jail. And you know, these weren't hardened criminals who'd lived a life of crime and for whom getting caught was just part of their business and they could accept going to jail as being a sort of an occupational hazard. These were people who had lived impeccably 
respectable lives, who'd been working hard, building up their businesses, and for whom even being accused of a crime was deeply painful and humiliating. To be prosecuted publicly and uh, have the papers talking about you was also a, a really painful humiliation. And they're getting sent to jail was something that they really, really struggled to cope with. I mean, how would you feel if you suddenly got arrested and thrown in jail and that's you for a couple of years? I mean, just like you say, just being accused destroys your business reputation, which could destroy your livelihood. Yes. And so, you know, people, people were sent to prison. And even when they got out, they'd lost their businesses, you know, marriages broke up, people had lost their health, there were suicides. It's just appalling. And um, this was first reported in the press, in the computer press, back in 2009. And the campaign just rolled on and on over the years. The magazine in the UK, Private Eye, was running with it. I subscribed to it. And so I'd been following it with great interest over the years. And then eventually the campaigning sub-postmasters managed to raise money to go to court. And they took the post office to the court. And there were two trials. And the first was about the contract relationship between sub-postmasters and the post office, which I've uh, alluded to how it was un- the contract was unfairly loaded against them. And that was important to get established first. And the judge ruled that it was an unfair contract and it should be set aside. And so that was worth doing before they went on to the second trial where they were looking at the horizon system. And they were looking at it from the point of view that the sub postmasters were being forced to use it under an unfair contract. And the sub postmasters were able to establish uh, to the satisfaction of the judge that the system was seriously flawed and flawed to the extent that it could not be relied on um, to provide legal evidence. And when the judge ruled in their favour emphatically and awarded them heavy costs and damages, uh, that paved the way for all these hundreds of sub-postmasters who'd been convicted to have their prosecutions uh, looked at again. And they've been getting cleared by the dozen in appeal cases, not just one sub-postmaster having their case heard. They've been going through a dozen th- dozens of the time and they've been cleared. And what is was particularly still interesting- Is today or is this all done and dusted and everyone's- No, no, it's, it's still carrying on. Um, there are separate legal systems in England and Scotland, and we're trailing a bit behind in Scotland because the law is different. It's, it, it, the whole scandal played out rather differently here. But in 90, probably 90% or more of the victims were in England, and they're ahead of us. And there were two interesting aspects to the, the appeals cases. The first obvious one was they were found, the appeals, sorry, the convictions were found to be unjust and unsustainable, and so they were cleared. But the appeal court also, uh, thanks to the really sterling work of their lawyers, they pre- the lawyers pressed the point that it wasn't simply that their convictions were unjust. The convictions, or rather the prosecutions, uh, were an abuse of process. Yeah. It wasn't simply that the court had got the facts wrong, the, the convictions should never have been brought in the first place based on the information that was available. And this is another interesting feature of the post office scandal. The post office, as I say, it was part of the British state. So it had many of the powers of a state organisation rather than being a private corporation. But then it was privatised into the private sector, but still being owned by the government and still retaining some of its powers, and the crucial power it kept was the power to prosecute. It didn't have to hand over uh, evidence to a public prosecutor to bring and persuade them to try and to bring a prosecution. They could prosecute themselves directly. So the post office were 
the alleged victim and they were the prosecutor too. And they were also the provider of all the evidence through this wretched horizon system. And it was established in these appeals that there was sufficient information available to the post office that they should have known that the prosecutions were unjustifiable, they were unjust, and as I said, the technical phrase was they were an abuse of process. Have the people it's a very serious power. finding. The people who were in power, have they been prosecuted for doing this? Have any of them personally faced justice for no. the damage no. they did? No. It, are, and, is there any prospect of that? Or did they just yes. get off free? Uh, all that they've suffered so far is public embarrassment. They've uh, The directors of the post office have taken huge sums and bonuses and they've been able to keep them and they've faced no real, they've not been held accountable so far. I think and I hope that they will be when the public yeah. inquiry works its way through to them. Well, that's uh, one of the, the problems in the industry in general, which is... We have bad software because ultimately so few people pay any kind of penalty or price for harming others with software. Yeah, and it's clear from uh, documents that I've seen that have been uncovered from the post office by lawyers who've been going in as a result of the court cases, as a, as a result of the appeal cases, They've unearthed documents that showed that the post office was aware. Uh, they, for, well, they were aware that uh, one of the main Fujitsu witnesses had lied to the court in one of the key prosecution cases. He'd said he'd withheld evidence of relevant Horizon bugs and, in, a, in effect, had told the court that Horizon was entirely reliable. We now know that he knew about relevant bugs that he, he did not tell the court about. We know that the post office had found out about this some 10 years ago. And yeah. this was known at board level. And they took the decision to right. cover up, basically. Well, my, my business is, is testing. And uh, I mean, the first impulse that, that I have when I hear about things like this is, Oh, uh, maybe the testing was bad testing, but in this case, the testers had 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 uncovered thousands of bugs. They they knew and were reporting exactly how bad this product was to management. Yeah, the, the testing was bad, uh, but the testing I, might have been it was really bad the test well. management and the risk <laughs> management the higher level executive management above the testers were the real problem. The testers in Fujitsu and the post office weren't being given the chance to, to do a decent job. Well, they uh, still found thousands of bugs. I mean, there were many, yeah. many, many known bugs. Uh, I, Indeed. Th and many years there's, ago, there's a company called Ashton Tate back in the early yeah. 90s, and they released a product called DBase 4, and it was so buggy that it uh, sank their company. Uh, and my company, Borland, where I worked, we bought Ashton Tate because Ashton Tate became affordable to be purchased because of this disaster. And when when that happened and I met the 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 develop the the test managers in my group met the test managers from Ashton Tate for the first time. Our first question was, didn't you guys test DBase 4 before you shipped it? And what we were told is not only did they test it, they found something like 15,000 uh, uh, bugs in it and reported them that had been not fixed. Uh, not only did they do that, they said that their own marketing demos didn't run on the day that they released the software. And that every single tester resigned on the day they released the, the product. That's how much they felt, how strongly they felt about this, this uh, uh, situation. Then they were begged mm -hmm. to unresign by the, 
by management that that had uh, finally realized that they were had been right all along to not release the product. Uh, but they lost their, their company over over that issue, uh, and and it was it was interesting to talk to them, given that they had done so much work and given so much information to management that had just been ignored by management. So when we see bad software, it's often the case, I think, that the that it's not that the testing was terrible, but it, it may have been. But it yeah, may also have been that management simply decided that uh, pro problems in software is normal. So just put it out there and it'll be okay. Yeah. Um, the testing almost certainly wasn't good enough. But however good the testers were, they would not have had a chance. I would have hated to be a tester in that position. I would have loved to have been uh, an IT auditor uh, at the post office at that point. Uh, I wouldn't have hung around. I'd, I'd have maybe lasted two or three years before I made so many enemies. It was time to move on. Uh, but you have to... <laughs> so what was made the whole development particularly complicated was that it was an outsourced supplier who was developing and they were using a procurement model that made things even worse. Uh, it, in the UK, in the, over the last 30 years, many government purchases are made through what, what are called PFI schemes, public finance initiatives. And the idea is to keep uh, money off the government books so that it doesn't count as debt. And so instead of, say, the government borrowing money to build a school, what they will do is they'll uh, write a contract with a private supplier who will build a school and own it and then lease that to the government and manage their premises for 30 years, 40 years, a really long-term project. Uh, and so the government never actually owns the asset. And that procurement model was used for the horizon development. And that caused serious problems for the assurance people. The, the, the post office were wanting to do early testing and get assurance people in to look at how the system was being built, how it's being designed. So yes. they weren't relying entirely on testing at acceptance testing stage. That makes sense, of course. Yeah. But what they found, they were hitting a brick wall repeatedly from Fujitsu, who were relying on the fact that it was a PFI contract and saying, no, this is not your system. This is our system. We're building it and we're just providing a service to you. All that you have an interest in is the quality of the output, the quality of the service that we provide. So you have no right to inspect the internal workings or to question us about how we're building it. Yeah. You don't have any right to see what's yeah. happening. So we hand something over for acceptance testing. Yeah. And the assurance people at the post office, I, I don't like the term quality assurance or assurance in this context, but that's what they were called. And they had a useful role to perform. And they were continually pestering Fujitsu, trying to get information, continually being knocked back. And they were not getting backed by their own yeah. management. And what that meant was that the whole testing and assurance process got backloaded onto the end of the development. Uh, and to make matters even worse, they were not given time to do acceptance testing. Instead, they went with live trials. Now, live trials are worth doing after acceptance testing, but the obvious problem with that is you've got to go with what the users are doing live. You can't plan testing. You can't force yeah. uh, your know, edge cases. You can't push through your know, right. unlikely well, that, but potentially that, disaster and failure that, scenarios. Yeah. You just got to go with what you got. Yeah. And so, uh, one of the assurance senior assurance people who was speaking to the inquiry said that yeah, they, they've been in 
firefighting mode throughout the development, there'd been all sorts, you knew there were all sorts of problems getting fixed. And when it came to release, as far as he was concerned, he was satisfied that the problems that had been found had been resolved, but he didn't know what else there was. And yeah. at the time, he said, I can't be confident about what we're shipping. And part, one of the reasons was that the attitude of the Fujitsu people, uh, the phrase that was actually used was they were focusing on the happy path, in effect. They were unwilling to look at what might go wrong, what the implications of that might be. Yeah. Uh, they, according so to this have, uh, uh, However decent the testing inside Fujitsu was where they knew well about all these problems, the acceptance testing was shallow and inadequate. Yes. And it was shallow and, also, and inadequate partly because they were under tremendous pressure and they were being bullied by management to accept this thing. Yeah, and I don't want to... I'm not going to be fair to management because they were incompetent and dishonest. But they might argue that a mitigating factor was that they were under huge political pressure, and they were, uh, from the government to get this thing in. Uh, however, that when you've got people operating under that sort of pressure, that's when you need uh, internal auditors who've got some real yeah. strength of character, who are prepared to say, this approach is creating risks that are unacceptable. And well, right. I mean, it, it, you can take any system that is a workable system and then just say, now, all the people in charge, I want to empty them of character. Just what if you have people of no strong character or morality running this, and that, that system is going to collapse. Yeah. It's going to be an abusive system. So uh, we what we see with, the thing is, what we see with software, and now we're seeing this with AI, is that people that find it so difficult to understand, to comprehend these systems, that they substitute for evidence that the system is good, they substitute their wishful beliefs, mm -hmm. hoping that the system is, is good enough. And they operate on these beliefs rather than on evidence, which is difficult to obtain this evidence. Yep. And it's hard to trust the people who are gathering the evidence. We're giving you potentially bad news. So, this is kind of a universal uh, problem, but in the case of the post office scandal, it had tragic consequences. And it suggests that somehow society has to evolve to, to deal with the problem of large scale software systems more forcefully and more, uh, um, carefully than it is able to do right now. And I don't know if there if that is really if it's going to take another 40 years to make that happen. Will it never happen? Uh, I, I don't know. But it, it means that software testing anyway is always going to be probably always going to be a a tough gig a difficult job to do and it ultimately depends on the character uh the 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 morality uh, the assertiveness the listening skills uh the grace of the people who are running this system yeah and um Testers are much more vulnerable than IT auditors are. Uh, yeah, I mean, any I, I compare testers to to fragile orchids. You know, you can easily destroy the effectiveness of a of a tester through creating a hostile working environment uh, uh, it, for them. I, that's something that I found difficult and frustrating when I moved out of uh, IT audit because. 
uh, we were bulletproof. And you, you, acquire, you have to acquire a certain hardness and arrogance. Uh, and because a properly set up internal audit department does not report to executive management, it, it should be reporting to non-executive directors on the board. And that means that you um, are immune from executive intimidation. They might shout at you and they'll threaten you, but you just laugh it off. Yeah. And uh, I've... Well, uh, I once worked... I more once power worked to on, you auditors. <laughs> I, I once worked on an, an audit of a subsidiary of a, the insurance company where I was, and there was all sorts of dubious things going on. And the general, UK general manager for the whole, not just that subsidiary, but at the higher level, was implicated because he'd he had been doing personal business with his subsidiary on a an advantageous basis, and he had not clamped down on how they were behaving. And I put my report together of what we'd found um, based on what was in the computer system. Um, I'd gone through the data very, very, very carefully, analysing it. And I wrote the report and then the group's chief auditor, uh, he read my report and he put in the management summary and he accused the UK general manager of abdicating his managerial responsibility. And then the report got issued. And we were in the same building, head office building, as this guy. And he came storming downstairs to have it out with the group's chief auditor. And there's an open plan office where I was sitting the other side of this partition, hearing the UK general manager harangue the group, group chief auditor. And when he'd finished, he's asked, wanting the report to be withdrawn. And the group chief auditor listened and said, have you finished? OK, the report's not changing. Goodbye. And that was it. And I was sort of cowering by the other side of the screen, <laughs> hoping I wasn't going to be called in to give my side the story. But well, this there was no need to get to what I said, no. Hmm? I, I, I kind of want to be an auditor now. They, they, it sounds oh, yeah, like because, they have, uh, they have but, a, a good, uh, but, good gig. But I mean, that, that is fun if you've got a certain mindset. It's fun when you can confront management who've been out of line or have been incompetent or have been a bit dishonest. And it is good fun challenging them once you get used to that. But you have to play the political game. You've got to understand the implications of what you're doing. You've got to pick your battles. You've got to understand what levers to press is, what buttons to push to get the right, right result. Right. So um, you would make an outstanding IT auditor if you're being carefully managed by somebody to do, do the political stuff for you. Right. So I'm not interested in that at all. That's why I'm an independent <laughs> consultant. So I can, yeah, my yeah. whole brand is that because, I... I just tell the truth. Hire me. You have to understand. Hire me if you want the truth, uh, and I'll give you the truth as best I can. Oh, 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 we we told the truth, but we'd pick our battles. And the, if we'd been involved in a development that was like Horizon, we'd have gone in hard. We'd have been instructed yeah. to put on our heavy boots and start kicking. Uh, that group chief auditor, one of his phrases was that, that it was our duty to go and take out the bullshitters. Yeah. And and that's fun. All right. Well, we're out of time. Uh All thank right. you, uh, uh James, for uh telling these uh these stories. Uh this is uh, quite an astonishing uh and tragic case of people yeah. abusing other people via software, via bad software. Um, and uh, I hope it continues to get uh, cleared up and I hope somehow uh, people are learning from this and, and maybe the next yes and I'm determined that people will learn be and something that I've learned from this is that it reinforces my belief in what Jerry Weinberg would always go on about that it's all about people it, it's all about in one people. sense it's people whose lives are being ruined by flawed software yeah. And it was people who were behaving badly or yeah. behaving in a cowardly manner or an irresponsible right. manner 
working in a big corporation that was out of control. Yeah. And the people who should have spotted that and done something to stop it yeah. didn't have their eyes on the ball. Yeah. So in a sense, it was a, a problem with technology, but the bigger problem was the people and it was people who suffered. And that's what we must never forget. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, well, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, James. Uh,